The General Principles of Sufism by Sirdar Iqbal Ali Shah Previously published in the Hibbert Journal 20, 1921-22, pages 524-35, revised. He that is purified by love is pure, and he that is absorbed in the Beloved and hath abandoned all else is a Sufi. Of the many mystical doctrines to which our mother the East has given birth, none is more beautiful in its appeal than the way of the Sufi, nor does any point to a goal of more exalted spiritual ambition. He who is versed in its tenets and practice has outsoared the shadow of doubt and the possibility of error. He is face to face with the divine. Many esoteric systems lay claim to such a consummation, but none with more justice than Sufism, for the disciplinary and preparatory measures it entails are of a kind to induce in the devotee an understanding that the ultimate goal to which he aspires will be triumphantly achieved. Sufism as an organized Islamic school dates from the latter part of the 11th century, and its projection through esotericist groups was founded by a branch of that sect community in Islam known as Ismailis, headed by Hassan Sabah, who, driven from Cairo by the persecution of the Orthodox, spread a modified form of the Ismaili doctrine throughout Syria and Persia. He was, indeed, a member of the great and mystical Western Lodge of the Ismailis at Cairo, the early history of which is one of romantic and absorbing interest. It comprised both men and women, who met in separate assemblies, and it was presided over by a Dai al Doat or chief missionary, who was usually a person of importance in the state. The assemblies, called Societies of Wisdom, were held twice a week, and at these gatherings all the members were clad in robes of spotless white. This organization was under the especial patronage of the Caliph, successor of the Prophet, to whom the lectures read within its walls were invariably submitted, and it was in the reign of the Caliph Hakim bi Amr Allah that steps were first taken to enlarge its scope and institute what might be called a forward movement for the dissemination of its particular principles. So that it should not lack suitable surroundings, the Caliph erected a stately edifice known as the Dar al Hikmat, or House of Wisdom. Within its walls, a magnificent library was installed, and writing materials and mathematical instruments were supplied for the use of all. Professors of law, mathematics, rhetoric, and medicine were appointed to instruct the faithful in the sciences. The annual income assigned to this establishment by the munificence of the caliph was 270,000 ducats, worth some $150 million. A regular course of instruction in mystic law was given to the devotees, and nine degrees had to be passed through before they were regarded as masters of the mysterious knowledge gained within the walls of the House of Wisdom. It was in the seventh of these stages that the doctrines of Sufism were more particularly taught, projected beyond ordinary education. But Hassan, a man of great natural force and enlightenment, saw clearly that the plan of the Society of Cairo was in some respects defective. His novel views did not, however, meet with the approval of the other leaders, and he retired to Persia, where he remodelled the course of instruction, reducing the number of initiatory degrees to seven, and instituting a much more rigorous system of discipline. Around the figure of Hassan cluster many legends and traditions most of which have been highly coloured by the passage of time. The Ismaili school deteriorated when it became a personality cult. It still survives as a minor sect. Note, the Ismaili faith, according to Sufi authorities, has had no Sufi content for the past three centuries, though some of its chiefs had from time to time sought Sufi recognition. We may now seek for some general definition of the doctrine, such as will make clear to us its purpose and significance, 
the message it holds for the mystic and for humanity in general. It exhibits a close connection with the Neoplatonism of Alexandria, with which it certainly had affinities, in that it regards man as a spark of the divine essence, a broken light from the great sun of our being, the most central and excellent radiance from which all things emanate. The soul of man is seen as being in exile from its creator, who is not only the author of its being, but also its spiritual home. The human body is the cage or prison house of the soul, and life on earth is regarded as banishment from God. Ere this ostracism from the divine took place, full communion with the Creator was enjoyed. Each soul has formerly seen the face of truth in its most real aspect, for what we regard as truth in the earth's sphere is but the shadow of that which shines above, perfect, immaculate, a mere reminiscence of the glories of a heavenly existence. To regain this lost felicity is the task of the Sufi who, by a delicate process of mental and moral training, restores the soul from its exile and leads it onward from stage to stage until at last it reaches the goal of perfect knowledge, truth and peace, reunion with the divine. As an example of the Sufi doctrine of the immanence of God in creation, an ancient manuscript tells us how the creation proceeds directly from God. The creation, it says, derives its existence from the splendor of God, and as at dawn the sun illuminates the earth, and the absence of its light is darkness, in a like manner all would be non-existent if there were no celestial radiance of the Creator diffused in the universe. As the light of the sun bears a relation to the temporal or the perceptible side of life, so does the splendor of God to the celestial or hidden phase of existence. And what words could be more eloquently illustrative of the belief that the present life is banishment of the soul from God than those of a great Asian Sufi, who on his deathbed wrote the following lines. Tell my friends when bewailing that they disbelieve and discredit the truth. You will find my mould lying, but no, it is not I. I roam far, far away in the sphere of immortality. This was once my house, my covering, but not my home. It was the cage, the bird has flown. It was the shell, the pearl has gone. I leave you toiling and distraught. I see you struggling as I journey on. Grieve not if one is missing from amongst you. Friends, let the house perish, let the shell decay. Break the cage, destroy the garment, I am far away. Call this not my death. It is the life of life for which I wearied and longed. There are now four stages through which the initiate must pass on his way to perfection and reunion with the divine essence, four veils that must be lifted ere his vision is purged of the grimness of this earth sphere, and he is granted the final wonder and bliss of coming face to face with truth eternal. The first of these stages is known as nasut, or humanity. The essential of proper observance in this phase, and the mere approach or avenue to the temple of Sufism, is the faithful observance of the tenets of Islam, its laws and ceremonies. This preliminary course is regarded as a necessary discipline for the weaker brethren, and as a wholesome restraint upon those who may be constitutionally unfitted to attain the heights of divine contemplation. Latitude in matters of discipline in the earlier stages frequently leads to evils which cease to trouble more powerful intellects and devouter souls as they gain the higher levels, so that in a later phase the trammels of ritual observance and symbolic recognition can be cast aside and aspiration remain unfettered. The second stage is called tarakat, or the manner of attaining what is known as jubrut, or potentiality of capacity. 
Here the neophyte dispenses with his guide and becomes a Sufi. It is frequently asserted that in this stage the pilgrim may, if he chooses, lay aside all the external forms of religion, its rites and observances, and exchange mere worship for the delights of contemplation. But more than one of the masters contests this view, refusing to recognize the freedom of the novice from religious forms, no matter to what degree of advancement he may have attained. There remains, however, a certain school, the members of which, though admitting that purity can be acquired in the first instance through the constant practice of orthodox austerities alone, assert that it cannot permanently be retained unless mere forms be transcended and outgrown. The third stage, Araf, signifies that a condition of assured knowledge or inspiration has been reached, which occultists might call a condition of adeptship or Buddhists are a hardship. The eyes of the pilgrim have been opened, he has gained possession of supernatural and inward knowledge, and is the equal of angels. Edgar Allan Poe alludes in one of his most wonderful poems, Al-Araf, to a mystical star which he calls by this name, and which he speaks of as a plane higher than this world, and not nearly so material. Oh. Nothing earthly save the ray thrown back from flowers of beauty's eye, as in these gardens where the day springs from the gems of circusi. Adorn you world afar, afar, the wandering star. Lastly, but this is remote and to be gained by the exalted in purity and holiness alone, is the stage of hakikat, or truth, perfect and supreme for the union of the soul with divinity is now complete. It is to be won only by long-continued meditation, constant prayer, and complete severance from all things gross and earthly, for the man must be annihilated ere the saint can exist. The fire, kalb, or steps of heart, deal, breath, nafs, the rest of soul, seer, head, ikfa, and crown and the head, Khafi, have been climbed, and he who was a scholar is now qualified to become a master. In order that this condition or state of exalted holiness may best be brought about, the life of the hermit is temporarily resorted to, and many, to attain it, retire into the gloomy solitude of the jungle or seek the quiet of desert fastnesses, or dwell in caves situated in the heart of almost inaccessible mountains. This devotion and singleness of purpose is indeed characteristic of Sufism. But such a life, spent in prayer and meditation, conduces to the acquisition of wisdom as well as moral exaltation, and many of the most renowned Sufis have been men of the highest erudition. Scholarship of the right kind is regarded as predisposing a man for the life of the Sufi. The philosophic temperament and the power of penetrating into the mysteries of the divine nature are often found in one and the same person. A tendency towards studious things raises a man above the level of the vulgar herd and prompts him to seek the higher excellences of holiness. It has been so in all times and in all faiths. Are not the ascetics of all religions habitually studious? And whence, it may be asked, has so much light been thrown on things spiritual as from the cave of the mystic or the desert abode of the Sufi? Although, of course, the vanity and consequent desire to oppose others often found in scholars and not overcome will produce the very reverse of the Sufi. The poet, especially, is looked upon as the type of man who may best develop into a Sufi of great sanctity. Poetry, indeed, may lead to the very essence of Sufism. The genius of the poet is akin to religious inspiration. The long flights by which he penetrates to the highest realms beyond the imagination are of the same nature as those by which the mystic reaches the gates of the palace of life and wisdom. 
In the throes of his rapture, the poet transports himself into the heavenly Empyrean. His wings bear him into that rare atmosphere where he can see face to face with the divine cause and origin of all. Sufism has a poetry all its own, a poetry regarded by many, whether Sufis or not, as more soulful and higher in ecstatic expression than that of any other religious activity in the world. Again, the language of poetry, its metaphor, its swift and pulsing rhythm, is more akin to the speech of the mystic than the grosser language of the sons of earth. It is not restrained by convention or the fetters of idiom. It soars supreme above the faltering, stammering necessities of the earth speech. Hence, in Central Asia, the true home of modern Sufism, as elsewhere, we find Sufi devotion often expressed through the cadences of poetry. Nor do the services of poetry to Sufi mysticism end with its provision of a more fitting medium of expression, for in Sufi verse the constant repetition of mystical illusion and religious allegory serves to conceal from the profane the hidden meaning of the experience, those deep and awful truths which it is not well that the vulgar should know, for their perceptions would distort it, and which at all costs must be guarded by the adept from profanation. That the inner significance of Sufi mysticism may be the more closely shut off from possible dilution, the language of eroticism and excess is frequently employed in its strophes to conceal hidden meanings. This has, perhaps naturally, resulted in a charge of luxury being brought against the Sufi literature as a whole. Nothing could be further from the truth. Scandalized by the interpretation placed upon the sacred writings by the ignorant, the great Mughal Aurangzeb, himself a Sufi of exalted degree and a moralist of the strictest tendencies, decreed that the poems of Hafiz and Jami should be perused only by those who are sufficiently advanced in spiritual understanding to appreciate the works of these poets at their proper worth. The great mass of people in India had misunderstood the metaphors and figures of the Persian singers, and their songs, he learned, were even regarded as provocative of immorality. Let it be admitted, too, that even Eastern supposed mystics, mere emotionalists, have misinterpreted the metaphorical expressions in which these poems abound. Speaking generally, it is the dark riddle of human life which the Sufi poet veils beneath the metaphor of physical love and the agony of parted lovers. By such means he symbolizes the banishment of the human soul from its eternal lover. The pain of earthly parting is merely a synonym for the deep anguish of the spirit estranged from its creator. The wine cup, again, and the language of debauch are metaphors which signify the rapture of the soul which is drunken with the love of God. We must here lay stress upon the great central doctrine of Sufism that the human soul is one in essence with the divine. The difference is one of degree and not of kind. However much men may differ from divinity, they are, after all, particles of the divine being, broken lights of God, as Tennyson so beautifully says, and will ultimately be reabsorbed in the great cause which projected them into the darksome regions of the earth plane. God is universal. He interpenetrates all matter, all substance. Perfect in his truth, goodness and beauty, they who love him alone know the real fullness of love. Mere physical love is an illusion, a seeming, a snare to the feet and an enemy in the path. The great mirror in which the divine splendor reflects itself is nature. From the beginning of things, I from the first, it has been the task of the supreme goodness to diffuse happiness among those fitted to receive it. Thousands ignore it, mistaking the pomps and pleasures of earth for joy, rejecting the greater bliss to their hands. In many faiths we hear of a covenant betwixt God and man, this is also the Sufi creed. 
That covenant has been broken by the sin of the creature against his creator. Only when man once more finds reunion with God shall he be restored to his ancient privileges of full and unalloyed fellowship with the divine. This alone is true happiness. The pursuit of the material is a vain thing. As Longfellow says, things are not what they seem. Nature, the earth, that which we see, feel and hear, are but the subjective visions of God, suggested to our minds by the great artist. Mind or spirit alone is imminent. The fleeting phantoms thrown by the phantasmagoria of matter we must beware of. We must attach ourselves to none of their manifestations. God alone is the one real existence, the only great reality. He exists in us and we in him. The visions he grants us, the pictures he casts upon the screen of our imagination, we may use as a means of approach to the eternal beauty, to the consideration of the divine. They are what Wordsworth calls intimations of immortality. As a great Frenchman once said, we weep when we listen to beautiful music, our eyes fill with tears on looking at a great picture or noble statue. A wonderful prospect in nature affects us in like manner. Wherefore? We weep because we feel that these things are but shadows of the real, the imperishable beauty which we have lost, and which we will not regain until we are once more made one with God. That Frenchman would have found in Sufism the compliment, the ideal, of his philosophy. The microcosmos, or small world, said the great Paracelsus, one of the most learned Europeans of the 16th century, who had travelled widely in the East, was but the reflection of the macrocosmos, or great world above, the spiritual world which mirrored itself in the plain below. To him the illusory and phantasmal nature of the sphere in which we dwell was very plain. Indeed, no European mystic of old could possibly have found anything at which he could have demurred in the tenets of Sufism. In my opinion, Western as well as Oriental mysticism is heavily indebted to the Sufi philosophy, and those who believe in one must naturally believe in both. It requires a mind of the first rank to recognize the great scheme of God at first sight. Few minds succeed in doing so. With most persons, long experience is needed ere they appreciate the marvelous arch plan of the Almighty. To a mind naturally pure and angelic, this wondrous cosmic symphony is apparent from the first. It was so to Mohammed, to Bohème, to Swedenborg, to Blake. What is man, after all, but the cloak of the soul? When we say that a man is naturally bad, we allude to the state of his inherited mind, not to his soul. The garment may be ragged, dross may cover the gold, but it is there all the same. Our bodies are of the earth, and such as our fathers leave us. Our souls are of God. O oh man, is there aught that, possessing the friendship of God, thou canst not compass? Doth not thy soul strain to him as the mountains strain unto the sun and the waters of the sea unto the moon? Verily thou dost move forth in the light of his strength, in the unquenchable brilliance of his boundless majesty, as a great star, lit by the beams of a still greater sun, launches forth into the million-lamped avenues of the night. As a ship is moved by the bright waves of the morning, so art thou urged by the breath of his Spirit. Verily thou art of God as a child is of its father. What then hast thou to fear, O son of such a father? With such a hope before us, before every one of us, if we accept it, we must turn our souls from vanity from all that is not of God, striving to approximate to his perfection and discover the secret of our kinship with him, until at last we reach the happy consummation of union with the divine. 
The Sufi doctrine tells us that at the moment of the creation of each creature, a divine voice was heard asking the question, Art thou not with God? Art thou not bound by solemn covenant with thy Creator? And each created spirit replied, Yes, as it stood in the presence of the Almighty Himself. Hence it is that the mystic words, Alastu, art thou not, and Bala, yes, occur so frequently in Sufi poetry. For example, Rumi began his celebrated Masnavi, which I have ventured to render into English verse, as follows. The Flute Oh, hear the flute's sad tale again, of separations I complain. Ere since it was my fate to be thus cut off from my parent tree, sweet moan I've made with pensive sigh, while men and women join my cry. Man's life is like this hollow rod, one end is in the lips of God, and from the other sweet notes fall, that to the mind the spirit call, and join us with the all in all. A regular vocabulary of the terms employed by the Sufis in their mystical poetry exists. Wine, for example, signifies devotion. Sleep, meditation on the divine perfection. Perfume, the hope of the divine afflatus. Zephyrs signify the gift of godly grace, and kisses, the transports of devotion and piety. But the terms of significance are often inverted in order that they may not be comprehended by the profane. Thus, idolaters, free thinkers and revelers are the terms employed to indicate those whose faith is of the purest description. The idol they adore is the creator himself, the tavern is the place of prayer, and the wine drunk therein is the holy beverage of love with which they become inebriated. The keeper of the tavern is the hierophant or spiritual leader. The term beauty is used to denote the perfection of God, and love locks and tresses the infinitude of his glory. Down on the cheeks is symbolic of the multitudinous spirits which serve him. Inebriation and dalliance typify that abstraction of soul which shows contempt of mundane affairs. The following extract from Sufi poetry will serve to illustrate the use of many of these mystical terms. At first sight, it would appear to be inspired by the spirit of amorous and bacchanalian frenzy, but when translated into its true terms, it reveals itself as of the veritable essence of mysticism. Yesterday, half inebriated, I passed by the quarter where the wine cellars dwell to seek out the daughter of an infidel who is a vendor of wine. At the end of the street a damsel with a fairy's cheek advanced before me, who, pagan-like, wore her tresses dishevelled over her shoulders like the sacerdotal thread. I said, O thou, to the arch of whose eyebrows the new moon is a shame, what quarter is this, and where is thy place of abode? Cast, she replied, thy rosary on the ground, and lay the thread of paganism thy shoulder upon. Cast stones at the glass of piety, and from an o'erflowing goblet quaff the wine. After that draw near me, that I may whisper one word in thine ear, for thou wilt accomplish thy journey, if thou wilt hearken to my words. Abandoning my heart altogether, and in ecstasy rapt, I followed her, till I came to a place where, alike, reason and religion forsook me. At a distance I beheld a company all inebriated and beside themselves, who came all frenzied and boiling with ardour from wine of love, without lutes, cymbals or vials, yet all full of mirth and melody, without wine or goblet or flask, yet all drinking unceasingly. When the thread of restraint slipped away from my hand, I desired to ask her one question, but she said unto me, Silence! This is no square temple whose gate thou canst precipitately attain. This is no mosque which thou canst reach with tumult, but without knowledge. This is the banquet house of infidels, and all within are intoxicated, 
all from eternity's dawn to the day of doom, in astonishment lost. Depart then from the cloister, and towards the tavern bend thy steps. Cast away the cloak of the dervish, and don thou the libertine's robe. I obeyed, and if thou desire with me the same hue and colour to acquire, imitate me, and both this and the next world sell for a drop of pure wine. One of the most celebrated exponents of Sufi doctrine is Jami, the author of Layla and Majnun. His name is venerated throughout Central Asia as one of the champions of the faith. In his belief, when the Creator pours the effulgence of his Holy Spirit upon the creature, such a one himself becomes divine. So closely indeed is he identified with the great source of all good, that he finds the power has been conferred upon him of sharing the regulation and direction of other beings. With the created beings whom he governs, he is connected by a powerful bond of sympathy, so strong indeed that in a mystical sense they are spoken of as his limbs, as parts of his body, nor can they suffer and endure anything that he must not endure and suffer as well through a process of psychical sympathy. One of the many mistaken objections to this portion of Sufi belief is that it implies that saintship is almost one and the same thing as deification. This is not so. At the basis of Sufi philosophy will be found the fundamental axiom that no mortal can be as a god. The union of the creature with God is not an apotheosis of man, but a return of a portion of the divine spirit to its original fount and nucleus. The result of the union of man and God is annihilation of the merely human part of man and the withdrawal of his spiritual part to that place whence it emanated. On the annihilation of self, man realizes that his own real and imperishable ego is one with the essence of God. In this union, so great is the influence of the eternal spirit that man's human judgment, that which we might describe as his logical faculty, his understanding, is entirely quenched and destroyed by it, even as error passeth away on the appearance of truth. In like manner, his ability to discriminate between the perishable and the imperishable is rendered negligible. This feeling of oneness with deity it was which urged the sage Mansur Halaj to ejaculate in a fit of ecstasy, I am truth, meaning thereby, I am God. But in the eyes of the orthodox this statement appeared blasphemous, and in making it Mansur forfeited his life. So little are those who grope in the purlieus and courts of the outer temple able to appreciate the wisdom and the speech of those who dwell in the inner sanctuaries. The presentation of the idea of the origin of evil, the question of dualism, has been the cause of much learned contention among erudite Sufis. Many have argued that evil cannot exist in the face of the fact that God is wholly good and all things are from him. One Sufi poet has said, The writer of our destiny is a fair and truthful writer, and never did he write that which is evil. Evil is, therefore, a thing entirely human, due to the frailty of man, to the perversion of the human will and the circumstances by which humanity is surrounded, the material environment which man believes to be real and which serves to distort his vision. It has no part in the being of God. It follows that all the so-called spiritual powers of evil those principalities of the air and demons of the abyss, the existence of which so many religious philosophies admit and even expressly urge, are nothing but figments of the human mind, misled by the phantasmagoria, the unrealities by which man is surrounded. Underlying the gorgeous imagery and lofty mysticism of Sufi poetry then, whether it be that of Persia or of the Middle East, there dwells a deep significance of human instruction, which he who seeks may find, shall find, if he be eager enough, ardent enough. In vain we search elsewhere for a system so satisfying to the soul, so full, when all is understood, 
of the higher, the more spiritual reasoning. We will not find it in the teachings of ancient Athens, in the wonderful philosophy of old Egypt, or in that child of both, the Neoplatonism of Alexandria. To these sources the expression of Sufism undoubtedly owes much, as we have seen. But it has refined them, has excogitated for itself a manner of thought beside which they seem almost elementary, and a symbolism and mystic teaching of much greater scope and loftiness. As I have indicated, there can be little doubt that it powerfully affected European mysticism, especially through Paracelsus and Bohème. It is, indeed, the true allegory of the inner life, its erotic imagery, its glorification of the grape, are but veils which seek to hide the great truths of existence, as the language of alchemy sought to preserve its discoveries from the vulgar. Sufi poetry speaks of a love which is not carnal, and of an inebriation produced by no material vine. These are the ecstasies and transports of divine affection. If it be mysterious, shall the bread of life be given to fools? Shall pearls be cast before swine? No. Let the wise seek till they find. That is the last word of all mysticism, oriental and occidental. Meditation upon it is the one true way to exaltation. <laughs>